Thank you all very much for coming out tonight. So I, I hope everybody has had a very good Spark Summit so far. And uh, we, have, we have made it almost to the end. But uh, hopefully, we're going to make these last few hours of Summit, uh, summit worth a while for everyone here. Uh, so I'm Frank Notaft. I'm the Technical Director for Healthcare and Life Sciences at Databricks. I wind up running our technical team that works with uh, you know, both our customers as well as doing, uh, doing development on our product areas in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, really excited about the program that we have today. You know, we'll hear, we'll hear very interesting stories across you know, really the entire healthcare and life sciences space. Um, but you know, before we get started, I wanted to invite Jan Stoika, who is our uh, executive chairman up. And uh, most importantly, he was uh, one of the, the faculty member who started the Spark project back, uh, back many years ago. So thank you very much, Jan. And please, uh, please introduce us all. Hi, everyone. Thanks all for coming. And uh, actually, we are really appreciating uh, you be he being here because the Spark Summit, so to speak, ended. So you are have to spend and take extra time to be here. So really appreciate that. Um, so and I'm also extremely excited about seeing so many of you here, so many new faces. And um, when we started the company, just to give you a little bit of perspective, in 2013, um, uh, we, we thought that our mission, and actually this was our first uh, mission statement, is to make big data simple. So we built a platform to make the big data simple because it was very hard to manage and process big data before that. And uh, then, but then soon after that, actually, we discovered what was, should, should have been from the beginning our mission, and that was obviously to make our customers successful. And obviously, these are not empty words because if you are successful, we are successful, right? So all the all uh, you know incentives are aligned, uh, but then you know I was talking with more and more customers, and something was clear, you know, very obvious, the, is that is that in different industries, obviously, it's like in order, in order for it, us to make you um, successful, this means to help you derive the value from the data. What does it mean to get more insights, improve your product, improve your businesses, um, come up with new products, and so forth? Do whatever you're, or maybe do whatever you're doing much faster and cheaper. Uh, but then the, it, it, we are confronted with this kind of a big problem, and that the big problem was that it was a gap between you know the platform we are building, and we are still proud about our platform. We, st we still think it's you know hopefully the state of the art, and you agree with us here. And the experts, domain experts in each industry. Right? It's a, it's a gap between the concepts, the problems, the way, to, they, the way to, they look at the solutions, right? So, so then we started, and started with uh, Bavesh here, it's like who was a partner in crime, and we started like one year and a half ago to start focusing on the verticals, to fill this gap. That was a goal. And um, we started to we say, well, let's start to do, you know, do things right. So first, because you're still a small company, you're still a small company even today, um, we start with one vertical, right? We take one vertical, we try to make it successful, we do it the right way, and then uh, if we are successful, we are going to replicate it. And that vertical was, hel uh, was healthcare and life science. Um, so we started one, one year and a half ago. I remember we have this kind of the first event where some in a snowy Boston. We have like 30, 40 people there. Um, it was, uh, you know, we're still pretty happy about that, but in no way, you know, like here probably we have 10x mo uh, more people. And, um, and then we started clearly, you know, like trying, f you know, to try, to, uh, how do we fill the gap? And uh, filling this gap, you know, bridging this gap, it was, it's, it's, it has to be a hol holistic solution, right? A holistic approach. Um, we need to understand, try to understand your problems, uh, try to understand uh, how can we help you, try to, ex to extract the patterns of the solutions, and then try to replicate them, and um, then also try from, uh, from our engineering side to build feature in our product, which again will inch up this kind of uh, where we are, again to close the gap. And so we put together this kind of HLS verticals, uh, Bavesh put it together, everything from sales, go to market, product, and even engineering. You are going to meet some of engineering, and you probably know some of our engineers who are working in this HLS, uh, HLS team. But there is one more thing which we, we, uh, we are very passionate about that, and why I am so happy to, he to see you here, because another way to fill the gap in one of the most effective ways is to build a community. Right? 
uh, and because this allows you here not only to learn from us, but to learn from your colleagues about how they solve similar problems. And this has been, you know, it's incredibly um, useful and incredibly, incredibly effective. Uh, effective. And um, so it's, it's, again, it's like one of our main goals here is beyond everything else to build a community. That's why we are here. And this is in our DNA, right? Because we are a company which is developing open source. Uh, you saw a lot of announcement even at the Spark Summit. We started with Spark. We started back in Berkeley in 2009. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, building a successful open source project is not about the code. It's about building a striving community. So with that being said, again, I want to welcome you. I really encourage you to talk not only with us, Databricks people, but talk among yourself. And we really love to hear not only what worked, but especially what didn't work. Because what worked, we cannot improve. But what didn't work, we can improve. <laughs> uh, and so again, welcome, and thanks, everyone, for being here. All right, well, thank you very much, Jan. So uh, I'll be talking a bit, uh, just, just to get us started about our agenda for tonight and some of the work that we're doing in Databricks. So uh, you know, we have three, three very exciting talks. I'll try to keep my remarks brief so that you can let the people who have more interesting stories to tell, uh, you know, have, have them, you know, let them take the spotlight. Uh, but we'll wind up hearing everything from how people are using Databricks to do anomaly detection on large, uh, large data sets. We'll hear some of the interesting work that people are doing in the life sciences to go ahead and combine very large data assets that they've invested very heavily in and learn on top of them at scale. And then we'll hear some of the, uh, you know, some of the kind of cutting edge work that we're seeing in the payer space where people are uh, you know, applying predictive models at very large scale to try to find ways that we can improve the way that we're treating people, improve the ways that we triage people into care. So uh, at the end, we'll have some more networking. So uh, hopefully, we'll inspire you all with a few talks, and then we'll get you all together to talk about how much fun you had at the end. That said, you know, I'd like to give you know, just a brief high bit on what we're doing at Databricks. As I said earlier, I'm a technical director, so I wind up having a, uh, an engineering team that I work very closely with, uh, who wind up building out some of our efforts in the advanced life sciences space, as well as a team of people that work very closely with customers to help build out and deploy their, you know, their large-scale applications, get them running at scale, and start to break, uh, you know, break new bounds in where they're using advanced analytics and machine learning on these large health and life science data sets. Um, you know, what really drives us at the end of the day is that everybody that we talk to, you know, we, 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 we're, we wind up being in this, this really fortunate situation where I, I get, just get to go around and talk with our customers and hear about the ways that they are finding new opportunities to impact human health care every single day. And this can be, you know, this can be things like using AI to wind up suggesting interventions that you might do in the clinic. This might be using machine learning to process large imaging data sets that today we either don't have the, you know, the person power to go through or we have actually just been sitting on for years but have never had an analysis plan to go through. We're starting to see really, you know, really groundbreaking work in precision medicine, both in, in terms of how we're using it in the, re in the research and development setting to start to get more insight into how, you know, how genetics impact disease and how we can use that to, to improve the design of drugs, but also how we can actually use that in a clinical setting to predict what diseases you're going to get and even start to head off you know, uh, very, very complex diseases like cancer before they start to appear clinically. So there's a, there's a lot of tremendous opportunity here, but you know, what, what actually has to happen to go ahead and drive that forward? What we think is a really, you know, really foundational part of this is this, you know, is really this rise in big data in the health and life sciences space. Uh, so a little backstory about me: I've, you know, I've, I've actually been working on Spark since Spark 0.5 Alpha. So I uh, used to lead a large project called the Big Data Genomics Atom Stack. We started this in 2013, and the funny thing was, no one really had big data in genomics up until, you know, really the last three years. So, you know, we had this long aspirational period where we said, everyone's going to have big data, everyone's going to have big data, we just have to wait and it's going to happen. Now, if you look, you know, genome sequencing is under $1,000. People have massive data sets that they're using to drive drug discovery. They can get very great readouts into, you know, what, what genetic variant caused someone, you know, uh, someone to either have a, a loss of a gene or actually a changed function in a gene that either gave them an increased risk or a protective effect against a certain disease, and they can use that information to go ahead and drive how they design drugs. 
If we go ahead and we look over on, uh, you know, on kind of the clinical and the commercial side of the house, you know, we have, you know, we have the fact that EMRs have come online and, you know, actually become very productive systems to go ahead and work with. They're not productive if you, ask, if you ask the physician, but once you get to the analytic side of the house, we have much greater insight into you know, what diseases people are coming across. We have the capability to take that data and transform it electronically into insight that we can use to drive this process. And um, the trouble is though, you know, when, when you think about having these very large data assets, no one is going to manually comb over it. It's impossible. So a lot, of, you know, a lot of people in the healthcare and life sciences space are turning to technologies like machine learning and AI so that they can go ahead and use machine, you know, large compute technology to get insight from this data in a programmatic fashion. So you know, we see about 75% of people across healthcare and life sciences saying that they think this is a, this is a way forward. About 65% of people in healthcare and life sciences currently have investments in healthcare and AI. But if we actually look at a study as to how, like, what the success rates are, they're actually pretty low. So we ran a study with uh, CIO.com talking to, talking to people across the whole enterprise sector about whether AI was actually succeeding. And we found that you know, two, out of every third, uh, two out of every three projects that had AI, that had machine learning, that had big data as a key thematic element would go ahead and fail. And even that one in every three project that would succeed would take at least half a year to get into production. So that's, a, you know, that's, that's not a great success story. Where we come into it is, you know, we're, we're fundamentally a data and analytics company. The, the way that we see it is we want to take the, the large scale problems that you're working on and come up with ways that we can close this gap. We want to we wanna apply data management best principles. We want to make cloud computing easy to use so that when you look at this two, and, you know, this two and three failure rate, you can get that to a 100% success rate. So, that's a lot of the way that we think about this space, whether it's making you know, large scale compute easy to spin up, easy to go ahead and democratize across an organization. We look at studies like the work that we've done at Regeneron where they've been able to roll out access to the genetic data, uh, data set across a lot of their bench scientists, people who previously didn't have any access to that data set as a great way that, that we can see successes like that. I think we'll hear some more examples of that, so I won't belabor this point, but that's just a general way that we think about this space. We wanna be an enabling technology that closes this last mile gap. If you look at our health and life sciences practice, you know, we, we are pretty broad. You know, we, um, you know, and even if you think about today, you'll hear a talk from a payer, a supplier, and a pharmaceutical company. Um, one of the great things with this is, again, we get, to hear, you know, we get to hear and see a lot of these fascinating use cases that, uh, that our customers are working on. What we hear about today in the, uh, in the payer space coming from Optum, we'll hear how they're using the uh, large-scale data to build predictive models that allow them to predict disease, uh, you know, disease progression. From McKesson, we'll hear about how they're trying to go ahead and combat misuse of, you know, of the large-scale pharmacy system so that we can de uh, deliver care and deliver pharmaceuticals in a much more cost-effective manner, thereby driving down healthcare waste and healthcare costs for every one of us. On the pharma side, we'll hear about how, how Amgen is going ahead and driving an enterprise-wide data strategy that is allowing their teams to be more productive and to, you know, allows them to kind of centralize and reduce, uh, you know, reduce the, uh, the impedance of getting, getting another, uh, another big data project started. What we won't hear about tonight are our efforts in genomics or imaging, but those are two areas that we spend a lot of time. So I just want to give you a quick update before we go into the talks. Um, one of the big areas that we spend a lot of time on our engineering side is our work in large-scale genomics. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, I, I have a personal interest in genomics, and we are really seeing a lot of these projects kick off, whether it's you know, the many pharmaceutical companies we work with that have access to the UK Biobank project, whether it's a lot of the health systems and national institutes that have gone ahead and spun up large-scale sequencing projects that allow them to more precisely profile how their individual population responds to, gene you know, is, is affected by genetic changes. Um, you know, you, you probably heard a lot at this conference about Delta. Um, you know, just gonna put that out there. We're trying to leverage this as well in the genomics space. So if you think about genomics, you know, we actually have a lot of customers that are sitting on petabytes and petabytes of genomic data that today they can't run their large scale analyses on because there's just no way to query this data ad hoc. So what we've built out is our unified analytics platform for genomics, uh, which we uh, deliver on the platform as our health and life sciences runtime. So you can just go into the drop down, select it, and run. 
we wind up having high performance data processing pipelines that allow you to run your genomic analyses end to end about 4x faster than standard tools. But where we really excel is when we get to those population scale analyses where you're pulling data from 500,000, a million patients, looking at it together and trying to get insight into statistical trends. Uh, we've recently released a lot of, uh, a lot of work in the space, including uh, you know, very efficient schemes for getting standard genomic file formats like VCF and BGen that store this population scale data into the Delta warehouse where you can then query on it interactively and also run these large scale statistical and machine learning analyses on genomic data. So we're very excited by this. We, you know, we'll, uh, we'll have a number of exciting updates that come out in the next six months, so, so please watch this space. Additionally, we've done a lot of work recently in the imaging space. Um, so this is led up by, uh, by a horizontal team that looks across all industries. You know, obviously, imaging is, uh, is not a problem specific to biomedicine, but we, we wind up running into a lot of interesting image flows. We actually had a very, uh, very large imaging workflow working on radiology images going to production earlier this year, where you know, we're actually looking across millions and millions of radiology slices. Um, we, we're seeing very similar trends pop up. You know, if you look in pharma, there's a, there's a lot of interest in high throughput screening. People are, in, are plunking down you know, millions of dollars per microscope and keeping these microscopes running day and night, day and night. Um, so, so you see a lot of large, uh, large image streams here. To go ahead and work on this, uh, work on this effectively, what we're, what we're delivering are a set of optimized image readers that allow you to get your common but uh, biomedical specific image data into Spark, into Delta, so you can read it in. And then we work very closely with our machine learning runtime team that is uh, going ahead and making scalable machine learning frameworks like the Horovod system that allows you to scale up machine learning jobs, uh, you know, run them not just on a single GPU, but run these deep learning jobs on many GPUs so that, we can, uh, so that we can really cut the time to train these models. We actually had an interesting case study in the digital pathology space. We were able to take training time from about, you know, one week to run through all the iterations needed to train a model to down to, you know, just a few hours, which allows people to experiment with their model topologies a lot more and ultimately get to better results with their machine learning jobs. So this is just a quick snapshot of what we're doing. Uh, I'll go ahead and transition to our speakers, but uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, really glad to have you all. And uh, next we'll have, uh, we'll have the nice folks from McKesson who are speaking. So uh, Abby, uh, Abby and all, please come on up. Hello. <laughs> I was told it will be only about 40 people, but it looks like a lot more than that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hope you are having fun or had fun so far. And uh, we are the good folks from McKesson. My name is Abi, and that's David. Um, I run uh, data and analytics uh, I, from the enterprise perspective uh, for McKesson. And David is a data scientist in our team. So we have been doing a lot of interesting things at McKesson and hope to talk to you about one of those uh, things where we have used Databricks and, oops, are you able to see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so this one, yeah, there you go. So how many of you actually know about McKesson? Show of hands. Yeah, fairly large number of people, considering that this is HLS, so that should be the case. Um, so McKesson is actually a most unknown Fortune 10 company. It's a Fortune 6 company with about over $208 billion of revenue. Uh, we have uh, roughly 78,000-odd people uh, as employees spread across uh, over 16 countries. Uh, we have presence in Europe, in US, Canada, uh, and smaller presence elsewhere as well. So uh, a lot of people don't know that we actually 
own or franchise about uh, 16,000 pharmacies across the world, which is fairly significant. Uh, also, a lot of people don't know that we have a, something called a US oncology network, where we support and we help a lot of oncologists out there, uh, about 9,000 plus oncologists to battle cancer. And so a lot of those things are very unknown about McKesson and just wanted to highlight that for you guys. Uh, in the whole process, though, you would start imagining that considering how much claim stuff that we run through pharmacies, how much work that we do uh, through uh, our US oncology network, uh, how much work we do through our distribution, because one third of the uh, medications in the US are actually distributed by McKesson. So it's a significant amount of data that we have. It's a significant amount of impact that we have in the overall healthcare space, and for us, it's very important to then make those right investments in order to extract insights from the data and make it successful for our patients and our various stakeholders, including manufacturers and physicians. Just a high-level slide on what exactly is happening in the healthcare analytics market. So there have been a huge number of investments from the venture capital perspective in the past uh, year, several years, that are focused entirely on healthcare analytics. So there's definitely a focus on improving patient condition, improving healthcare costs, improving reimbursement, uh, thinking about how do you get uh, better clinical trials, how do you get better uh, medications faster to the market and stuff. And so there's a lot of investment going on all over, the, all over the place. We have, as an organization, and I'm sure a lot of other folks as well, are making internal investments as well to make that happen from the data science and analytics perspective. And we have been making that too. So um, one very specific business and one very specific process we are going to talk about and how we looked into data science and how we uh, collaborated with the Databricks platform to make it easy for us. So this is essentially our copay assistance program that we help with. So a lot of manufacturers of uh, medications, um, they uh, run copay assistance programs in order to get patients to be able to get to the medications that they need, and a lot of those are specialty oncology type medications which have a very high copay deductible upfront, especially for patients who are on the high deductible type programs. And so uh, it helps them get onto those medications and then hopefully sustain them for longer term. So McKesson has a business unit known as RX Crossroads, which helps manufacturers manage all those programs. So help them with, uh, uh, you know, the copay cards help them with figuring out how the patients can go and can make it easy for them to go to a pharmacy and get their medications and uh, be able to manage their drugs. And so we have uh, developed a very universal solution, almost like a plug and play where a manufacturer can come in and say, okay, I want to run a copay assistance program, and then we help them run it to any pharmacy at all in the US and run it through any sort of geography or any particular segment of the market as they want to access or as they want to uh, be able to cater to. Um, so in, in that particular uh, copay assistance program, we actually have a lot of issues. So the main uh, issue that we have is uh, Humans being how humans are, they always try to game the system one way or the other. And so we have seen a lot of situations where uh, there have been substantial abuses in terms of claims, so making some sort of uh, claims that are anomalous, making claims that are not right, uh, through, either through a pharmacy or through a physician or through a patient, et cetera. And this, this causes a lot of uh, problems, both in terms of uh, the ability for patients to be able to get that medication in the first, first place. 
So a lot of medi uh, people, a lot of patients who should actually be getting a medication are not getting that medication because someone else is uh, abusing that system and uh, making a false claim against that particular medication. There are situations where, uh, because of the claims, the manufacturers think that they are actually helping out the patients, but it's not happening. Manufacturers are getting the wrong information. Manufacturers are not getting access to the market. Um, there are situations where uh, pharmacies uh, themselves are not compliant in some situations, and they are uh, part of the overall, uh, you know, uh, abuse of the system, but there are also pharmacies that are not abusing the system, and so we have to be very careful about uh, delineating which ones are actually doing the abuse and which ones are not, and so it becomes a very important factor for us to figure those things out. And then um, these abuses actually drive the overall cost of healthcare across the board, um, because you are making copay assistance which is not going anywhere. And so ultimately, everyone is losing except for uh, the people who are perpetrating this uh, abuse. So what are some of the categories of the anomalies that we have experienced um, through, the, uh, through the analysis that we've been doing? So first is the patient side itself. So what will happen is there will be falsified patient data that is part of the claims data. And once, uh, and it's put in such a way that uh, one way or the other, the claim gets justified. And it goes to a patient who may not be eligible, especially a patient on government assistance program. So Medicare, Medicaid, they actually do not allow you to uh, take copay assistance because of various reasons. And there could be uh, anomalous data that's coming in from the pharmacy to make those claims. And again, everyone loses, and it's, it's a bad deal for everyone. Uh, there are prescriptions. So people, uh, especially on the pharmacy side, or physicians who would write uh, wrong prescriptions to then have people claim you know, copay assistance against that. And again, that's clearly uh, abusive behavior, and it's very important for us to figure out what exactly is happening. Um, there are you know, prescriber-related anomalies, either a wrong prescriber or a totally not uh, right prescriber. Uh, there are insurance-related stuff. So there could be potentially uh, data that's from the insurance perspective that shows a false uh, insurance, and that becomes part of the claims information. And uh, again, that that does not work well for anyone. And besides that, we, are, we also have a totally uh, list of unknowns that we don't even know about and the various uh, you know, claims, abusive claims that are being, uh, being uh, you know, uh, processed have, again, a huge, lot, huge amount of impact overall for us. So those are some of the major challenges that we uh, face in the in the copay assistance program. And now David will talk about how we have been using Databricks and the overall technology to help, help us solve for that. Thanks, Avi. Uh, so what I help our team do is actually implement Databricks for our, um, our data scientists and data engineers to work with. And it's been one of my favorite things to work with over the last year and a half, and it's the go-to because we get a, everybody up on the same page working off of the same platform right off the bat. And um, that's really what we're looking for. We don't want to stitch everything together. We don't want to do everything open source, but it's really nice if somebody's brought a bunch of that stuff together into a platform that lets us do 90% of the effort and then maybe customize that last 10% of it. And that's my favorite part because we get to use scikit-learn. We get to use the nice Spark things. We get to use anything Python-centric or Scala-centric and then SQL across the board as well so our data engineers can always help us out and hook into things that we want really nicely. And I know our data engineers are big fans of Delta. When it comes around, they just say, uh, hey, whenever you want a, um, a, um, a stream data store, just ask us to turn Delta on and just using Delta. And that's an easy change in your SQL and the Databricks notebooks. And then when actually we go and consult to other business units across McKesson, a part of the core data science and engineering team, 
when we get to bring them up to a best, um, best standard of practice and a community of practice, if we're all using the same environment, then they are enabled and more efficient much more quickly, and so they're on par with us, and they're on the same page. We get it Git versions, we get comments, we get shared and private repos and projects. And then the best part about that, especially the most important part, is the PII and PHI compliance per project. Not everybody is eligible to look at the same data sources. And so when we create those Databricks workspaces, we can actually make it so the control list, depending on which cloud provider we're with, it is most appropriate for that project and those persons accessing that data. Uh, as, as you can see here, the current copay kind of anomalous system that we built, we did that in uh, 12 weeks from no domain knowledge whatsoever. I didn't know anything about copay insurance, so there was like three months of me trying to, they were explaining it and how it works, and so I'm on like VA healthcare, so I had no idea of how any of this worked, so it took a long, took them a long while to explain it to me, and that was partly my fault for being uneducated on it. But the domain experts that were working with the RX Crossroads, they helped us codify the anomalies that they were seeing into either just rules-based engines, just functions that we could identify and flag stuff with, or actually implementing machine learning models through scikit-learn or Spark ML or something like that. And now with the, um, the partnership with MLflow and the development that Databricks is giving into it, we can then roll that into there. We don't have to go with SageMaker. We don't have to go with Cloud Machine Learning Engine or whatever it is. We can just call Python, MLflow, and then we get those reproducible, compartmentalized experience, uh, experiments inside of those notebooks, too, on the cluster, whether we're using one CPU or we're using all of them. Uh, well, all of the ones that the platform team will let me turn on. It's, it's really nice, because then we can just you know, all be on the same page, and then we're all working off the same version of everything instead of data scientists who are really bad at source control sometimes. We are not always committing our things. We have these siloed notebooks. I have untitled underscore 24 notebook that's not versioned. I have a bunch of comments in there. Some of you are familiar. So, and then it's not just me. I have four other colleagues that are doing it and then another business unit I don't know so personally well. But if it's all on Databricks and it's all in the workspace, you're much more accountable, it's much more visible. You can't take four weeks to write, like redo your notebooks and write all the comments and mark down and everything like that. Right off the bat, we're all working off the same stuff. And it should be, it's accountable, but it's also helpful that we're all on the same page as well. So that's why I like Databricks, is it gives me that place that I can do 90% of my work, the other 10%, I'll figure out how to like, get Databricks to do it, hook into it, or if they're already coming out with um, Spark serving, I was at that talk earlier, that solves another 3% of my problems, so. Um, so a little bit more detailed into that processing pipeline text that was kind of in there. The workflow, notebook workflows are super helpful for us. So if you're familiar with Papermill and Jupyter Notebooks, what Papermill does is allows you to string those together kind of like a um, Airflow or Luigi Celery task workflow pipeline. And so workflows kind of gives you the same API where we can actually pass structured data, or just information between notebooks and we can hook those together. So say I want to pass a Spark data frame or a Pandas data frame from my EDA to my training to my test to my inference or whatever it is, I can string all those together. And then on top of that, I can have a cron job at the end of everything that kicks those batches off if I ever wanted to. And then you could actually run multiple workflows um, um, at the same time, parallel workflows. So if you can see through there, you can string it all together and in the end, we're gonna actually end up running MLflow experiments. So maybe one model that we're running on some copay um, anomalous data, maybe they're running a isolation forest and it's pure Spark. The other one might be a little bit more computationally intensive and it needs to utilize that Spark cluster that's under the hood that Databricks gives us right off the bat. That's gonna be maybe we have to put in that third party Spark library iForest because maybe we just need to, we need to flex those computational muscles under the hood and that's what's gonna give it to us. But we're also pretty bad at cluster management as data scientists because the platform team can't just you know, babysit us the whole time, so that's where the auto-scaling and the auto-termination come in handy. 60 minutes, flat out, if I'm running something, it turns off, it always spins up in a matter of a few minutes every time we turn it on. So I don't have to worry about us running up costs everywhere because they just kind of build that in for us, which that makes us look better as a team, then uh, it's always there for us too when we turn it on. Um, so when we solved this problem, I was talking about the domain experts on the RX Crossroads teams, the health and life sciences team. 
they knew everything about it, but we had to learn it and then codify it, but we could not possibly remove this person from the problem or all those peoples in the problem because it was just inappropriate to do so and it wasn't nearly as efficient. So what we ended up doing, what they wanted, was to for help, have us help them figure out what they needed to look at first. What was the most anomalous? What was the most costly? Whether it was hours, whether it was dollars, or whatever it might be, tell us what we should be looking at so we don't waste all our time looking through millions of claims or trying to look through just 10 claims to find out we're looking at the wrong claims. Uh, and for us as a data scientist, we like the, 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 the experiments we get out of MLflow, we get like the computation we get out of Databricks, and then we get to hook that all into Tableau for the users at the end, so when we deliver a dashboard or something like that, it already hooks in, it's a nice JDBC connection, so if you got JDBC, you can connect anywhere. Uh, and this just goes into some of the finer details of what we like, the easy cluster management, the notebooks, the job scheduler, and you can do all of these outside of it and on your local machine, but then you're also on your local machine. So sometimes when we talk to other teams, it's like, well, I can do this with Jupyter, I can do this with Luigi, Celery, whatever it is, I can do this with a cron job. Yes, you can, but I can't see that on your machine. Are you gonna like put this in Git? Is this all gonna be up there? Or can we all be having the same features and functionality on Databricks, on the cloud, at the same time, together? And that's, that's, that's the biggest selling point I like to bring to other teams when we actually sit down and start hashing and, and, and packing some things together. The biggest, the biggest takeaway we had from that was the actual rigor that you, they could put into the analysis for looking at an, um, anomalous data because they, they had heuristics and tribal knowledge of what they were trying to do, but they didn't really know how to validate what they were doing next. And the, the feedback loop of the validation was very long. So it took a long time for them to figure out, was this really anomalous? Could we contact it? What was the supporting information and data? So once we figured out all their wants and needs, we would actually bring that back together. We engineer it, we, we kind of um, pool it all together, we run some of our inference on it, we run some of the models on it, whether it's rule-based or machine learning-based, we propagate that all together so then we give them the most anomalous data that is the most important to them based off of what they've told us. And that, that was kind of the, um, the, the full life cycle of this project thus far, and um, it's, it's ongoing and it's, um, it's really nice to have that all on Databricks and everybody kind of working on the same page and now giving other teams the demos of Databricks internally to say like, hey, we heard you guys were using this, can you show us? So that's not a selling point, it's six months down the road when I go consult with that team and embed with them over in, in Jacksonville, Florida, I already know they're on the same page and they're already gonna be using the same infrastructure and stuff as the, as the core community of our team is. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left of our 30, but I did want to give credit out to the other persons on this team, especially the Kesson Health and Life Sciences. We would not have been nearly as successful without them, the domain experts, because if I just went in there blindly, you know, swing an auto ML at this thing, it would have been really terrible. But the fact that we had really key heuristics and rule-based engines to go off of, and a lot of the flags they helped us kind of discover, that's what actually made uh, anomaly detection with copay uh, misuse and abuse programs really beneficial to McKesson to make sure the patient's experience and everything after that is better down the road. From what we're doing now, it's gonna have that effect down the road continually. All right, are there any questions? I'll, Abby and I might be able to take them. I don't know, Michael? Yeah, sure, if anyone has a question, bring the mic around. Sorry, my question is more oriented around the patient-centered care side of things. I mean, I, I saw a lot that you're investing quite a lot in uh, detection of raw or fraud. What are you guys doing in terms of uh, facilitating something which actually provides more on the patient care side, given your life sciences background? Yeah, absolutely. So we have actually a lot of programs that are running right now to help with patient-centric care, both in terms of the actual business programs, so things like how do you improve the 
uh, medication adherence of the patients, uh, thinking through what are the different claims data sets, what are our experiences in integrating with patients through our patient support programs and a bunch of other things. So think about medication adherence, how do you build uh, a digital interface around that in order to make it even better for the patient to, uh, to be able to work with us and be adherent to their medications. We have a bunch of uh, initiatives where we are thinking about how do you uh, improve clinical trials. So for example, we have a network of uh, more than 9,000 oncologists that we support, and we have probably, arguably, the largest uh, oncology data set in the US. And so we are thinking through, okay, how do we make it browsable? How do we uh, you know, make it in such a way that we can actually uh, work through uh, that data set and help the manufacturers develop medications or do clinical trials with the right patients and identify them quickly and rapidly. So things like those we are working on. And then there are also a bunch of other things, other initiatives from the digital perspective, from the perspective of lowering the, the cost, from perspective of thinking about reimbursements and stuff like that. So we are working closely with various stakeholders, hospitals, pharmacies, everyone else uh, to make that happen. Uh, we are also working with a lot of manufacturers to give them insights on how their drug is being used across different pharmacies or different markets, different demographics, et cetera, so that they can improve the targeting of the drugs better. They can improve the overall effectiveness of uh, their drugs and medication adherence. So lots of initiatives going on. Thanks for the question. We have time for one more. So I have, I guess, uh, just two quick questions. One for your fraud model, how much outside data did you bring in, I guess, to help um, train that? And then the second one, hopefully, is quick, too, is for the ones you did identify, does that feed back into the model to improve the training process? Our, our anomaly detection model? Our, our, so the anomaly detection was um, we had, they had access to certain things. So the anomaly detection model, the question was how much data did we bring in for the anomaly detection model, and then um, what's the feedback loop look like? Um, the data was already there, and so we just had to hook into it, make sure we got our compliant training and everything like that, made sure the cloud environment was up to date and stuff like that. We're now just exploring what parallel data might have any sort of benefit now that the project has exposure across the business units. Some of them are now talking about like, oh, we have something like that. So now everybody is seeing how, how helpful and effective it is, and we then we'll vet what else we can bring into it. But we just started with a small scope at first because we don't want to um, um, convolute it whatsoever. Uh, we just work with what they were already working with, add small things one at a time. And then the feedback loop with that is, so say they get propagated something that's, hey, hey you should look at this. This looks like really anomalous. So they're actually going to open up a JIRA ticket. They'll go in there, and they'll just start annotating stuff. And so we get that JIRA ticket with a bunch of human-validated information. We actually feed that back into its own other data set that then enriches the model. So therefore, we can say, oh, this is validated. Oh, this was a, a false positive, whatever it might have been. And here's a bunch of contextual information into it as well. So the more they use this, the better it's going to be in the long run. And that was the feedback loop that kind of happened at the bottom there. And that's, um, you know to be validated further and further as, as time goes on, but it should get better and better at the same time. All right, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, thank you very much, David and Abby. So uh, now we'll switch gears from talking about how we're distributing and, uh, you know, and uh, distributing, paying for, and supplying drugs, and we'll talk about the drug development life cycle. So I'd like to welcome up uh, Deepak, uh, Deepak from, uh, from Amgen. So he'll go ahead and give us, a, give us an overlay for how they've actually built out this large-scale data ecosystem to support the, the drug life cycle. Right. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. You know the drill. If you don't hear me, just raise your hand. Does that look right? Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Deepak Aburi, and I lead the data and analytics platforms at Amgen. 
Today, I'm going to talk briefly about our journey in building a data platform at Amgen. I heard there's a fresh round of cocktails that's going to be served after the drinks, after this. So let's get going. <laughs> I think this comes. Thank you. Yep, yep. Uh, I'll take the next one. That one's wrong. Technical difficulties here. Give us a minute. All right, first things first, who are we and what do we do? Amgen's one of the leading biotech companies around the world, found back in 1980, not too far from here, in the southern half of California in the Ventura County. 40 years, less than 40 years later, today we, are, we have a footprint in more than 100 countries. And we have more than 20 different products ranging across six therapeutic areas all the way from cardiovascular, oncology, neurology, nephrology, inflammation, and uh, bone health. With our products, we've saved millions of lives and touched several more millions of patients across the globe. So you might ask a pharmaceutical company, why do we care about a modern data platform? So what you see up on the screen there is our different phases in a drug manufacturing life cycle, right? Most of you should already be familiar with that. So be it the ability to understand the genomic data or the protein engineering, or be it the ability to run our clinical trials at massive scale, or being able to run efficiently our manufacturing plants, or even being the ability to take the drugs to millions of patients, it's all around data. Data is at the core. And these challenges and problems are unique in each of these verticals. Our research teams often have to deal with lab instrument data, unstructured data. Most of the unstructured data still remains untapped. Clinical trials teams, these are the teams that are dealing with huge volumes of data. Not just data from our own clinical trials, but also partnerships with the real world evidence data. So we are constantly, these teams constantly worrying about how to manage the data and how to cohort the analysis amongst all the data sets. Manufacturing plants and sensors from our manufacturing plants are pushing data back minute after minute back to our systems. So we're having to worry about how to stream these big large data sets back into our systems. And our marketing teams, these are the teams that are actually demanding for most innovative and advanced predictive analytic systems right at uh, the time, right time and the right moment. Right? So the data is at the core. Enough about the data. What's really in it for the business? Molecular discovery is a very important process. And if we are able to use the data to accelerate that process even a tiny bit, it literally translates into accelerating our ability to find those new drugs to treat those new uh, diseases. And on the clinical trial side, as crucial as it is, it's just a painstaking and expensive process. If we can use the right data to actually accelerate that, that translates itself into being able to take the drugs faster to the market, being able to take our drugs and save more patients' lives. Supply chain and inventory management, this is just a nightmare for any manufacturing company. And drug manufacturing is just no exception. So again, in this area, if we are able to do that, again, the benefits, business benefits are too many. Commercialization, this is an interesting one that's getting very, very complex in the recent years for many external reasons. So being able to operate global sales team is no joke. And these teams are in high demand of the right analytics and insights at the right time to be able to take those right actions. And for us to be able to do it, we actually needed some advanced analytics, machine learning, and data science to enable our data science teams to be able to do that. So all of these opportunities and reasons is what really got us to thinking about the need of a modern data platform. And we just didn't want to build a platform that solves these challenges and problems for each of these business units. We wanted a set of platforms that will actually give us interoperability and inter interconnectivity across all these departments. 
We wanted a set of platforms that would help us take all the way from molecules to market reach. A set of platforms that would support different personas all the way from our business user, our executives, our data scientists, data analyst, analyst analysts, and every data enthusiast in the enterprise. So we wanted that one single solution. That is what we wanted to build, right? So that vision took its first step maybe about five years ago. So the first step we put into the big data world is with Hadoop. So we, we built our first data lake, which we cutely call it EDL 1.0, with HDFS as a file storage. For our compute, we went through the journey of then. Can you all still hear me? For the compute, we went through multiple technologies. We used Hive, we used Pig, we used Impala, we used Spark. And all the other tools in the Hadoop ecosystem, we went along. Prior to this world, our data was very siloed, very structured and rectangular, sitting in multiple databases and multiple data warehouses. We had Oracle, we had Teradata, all across. So what Hadoop gave is basically an ability to actually scale our storage much larger than what we were used to back then, at a cost that is much, much, relatively lo much lower per terabyte than we were used to. Right? It was all hunky-dory. Pretty soon, we started realizing the limitations of this architecture. The way we saw this is we had two, Hadoop, two clusters, one on on-prem and one on, one on uh, cloud. We put in reporting systems and ETL systems into that. We put in multiple tenants into each of the cluster. Some of the challenges are the first challenge we ran into is these tenants weren't really good neighbors. They started fighting around for resources. Reporting and ETL, those were, again, fighting for, class, fighting for resources, compute resources as well as storage. Lifecycle upgrades really became a nightmare. That was another challenge that we ran into. We had to deal with multiple teams with multiple priorities. And any, any lifecycle activity is just a nightmare today. And we still have footprint, considerable footprint in this world. So the next limitation that we ran into is our storage capacity really increased with this, but it didn't take as long to actually fill that capacity. So today, every quarter, our teams spend considerable time just to archive or purge the data. We archive some of the data into cloud S3 objects. So it's just taking too much time to actually get some space back. And the whole point of scalable systems not just met. Although many of these components are open source, it was still not meeting our uh, needs of being able to very uh, interconnect, very, very independent architecture. So this is still more tightly coupled than we wanted it to. If we had to change a component of this architecture, it was still a nightmare. We had to do it. And uh, we, we had to basically rip open most of the pieces there. It was just not there as we wanted it. So that led us to start thinking about what should really the evolution of this platform is. That is where we came up with our modern data platform. What you see up there is really a group of three different platforms that you see. On the bottom, you see what we call as the next version of Enterprise Data Lake, again, which we cutely call EDL 2.0. On the top, you see our two platforms, one for the analytics on the left, top left, and uh, the data science workbench to meet our different personas across the enterprise. So EDL, on, the, on the, new, the newer version of Data Lake, right? So this is our version of Data Lake, which is completely on AWS. So we separated our storage and compute completely out. So all our data predominantly sits in S3 today as object stores. Our compute is Spark, mainly coming from our ETL Databricks clusters. And the rest of the architecture in this platform is very modularized. We have IAM, LDAP, and Okta meeting our security needs to take care of all the security needs across our teams. Our monitoring, we used different open source projects. Kibana and Grafana are a couple that we have used there. And Airflow is helping us do the orchestration. It's quite modularized in this architecture. And I'll go in a little bit deeper into that in the next slide. And then comes the data science platforms. The data science workbench is another in-house build platform that we wanted as a one-stop shop for all our data science community. 
Again, here we had Databricks at the, cru at, at the crux of that. We use notebooks clusters to actually help this. Our vision for this is as a one-stop shop for a data scientist across the enterprise to be able to access any data in the enterprise. And then our analytics, BI tools. Tableau and Spotfire are our, plat are our choice of tools that meet most of our user base needs. Over here, we use our reporting cluster along, again with Databricks to get the data out of the data lake into the hands of the right user. So collectively with this ecosystem, we were able to meet the needs of different personas across the enterprise. There are a few things we love about this architecture. The first thing is it's completely separate storage and compute. What it means is it gave us the ability to scale to infinite limits separately. We no longer had to actually throw in hardware just because we ran out of space. Nor did we have to ha throw in hardware against this architecture just because we needed more compute. And with our AWS, thanks to all the innovation that's happening on the cloud, thanks to AWS and thanks to Databricks, we were actually able to meet that. The second beautiful thing here is each application is isolated, yet they're very interconnected. Each application runs and updates at their own life cycle. So we have multiple versions of Airflow for different applications in this architecture. It's easy and self-service for, for these teams. So me and my team don't have to worry about the administration of each of these teams as much as we have to worry about the Hadoop ecosystem, the previous version that we had. And lastly, we were able to meet the needs and standardize what our data engineers and data science teams need to do. So it's a one-stop shop. Databricks Notebooks is actually meeting the needs of both kind of a personas, whether it's a data, data engineering job or a data science job. Data, Databricks Notebooks is able to give that for us, right? All in all, it was a lower cost of ownership across these. It was flexible and modular architecture that actually helped us be able to remove pieces as we need. So in fact, this, an example a few months ago, not, not more than six months ago, one of my data engineers sitting there, we attempted to replace Airflow out with a managed version of it. We decided not to. We loved Airflow too much, so we stuck to it. But the point there is, had the POC worked well, Replacing Airflow in this modular architecture and integrating another orchestration would not have been a nightmare. It, it would not have been a disruptive uh, move for us. So this one's a double click into the EDL architecture. I touched pieces of this already, so let's, let's take a deeper look into this. So like I said, the storage is predominantly on S3. So we layered our data into multiple layers, and accordingly our computes also around that. So Databricks is the key at the compute. So our ETL clusters is where all this mainly comes in. We built several common components using EKS Kubernetes, and we deployed into the enterprise for reuse. So we have ingestion service. We have services to monitor. We have the services to manage uh, the Airflow instances and uh, jobs around that. Monitoring is Kibana and Grafana that we are using. And we were able to meet all the needs. And out on, out on the right, on the insides, all our analytical tools, including our custom homegrown data science workbench solution, was able to seamlessly integrate with our data lake solution here. So earlier, I talked about connected data ecosystem, right? So how is this connected? How is this architecture connected? So I'm going to touch upon the two main platforms here that made us uh, get there. So as an enterprise, we have rolled out our strategy as EDL first. So what it means is we wanted every project for data and analytics to adopt the idea of using the EDL. Our vision is to get more and more data across the enterprise and hydrate this lake. A lake with no data is really useless. It's a dried up lake. So the second thing it helped us is really standardized on our technology stack. In the previous world, we had to keep up with all the technologies. There are just way too many. You know, there's Spark, there's Impala, there's Hive, there's everything all over. So we were actually able to uh, standardize that. And Databricks gave us the ability to actually to uh, have a managed Spark version there. And our vision is basically to get most of our enterprise data and retire our legacy footprint in this year or the next. So the second platform that really helped us get there is our data science workbench. So this one's a platform that we piloted with our commercial teams. Not more than, not less, you know, it's 2018, late 2018 is when we did that, a little over six months ago. And 
as early as three months ago, we now open it up for the rest of the enterprise. Today, we have about 25 different production projects on this data science workbench. And our vision for this is to give a data scientist that comes in into the enterprise the ability to provision a project, find the data that he or she needs, and be able to request an access to that, get access to that data, build models, and then be able to deploy that, and then share it with others. So we had used data science workbench. This is basically a web. It started as a web application to begin with, with Databricks at the crux. And we are now evolving it further and further to meet the needs there. So that is how we wanted to do this across as a, as a connected data ecosystem, not just across our business units, but also across different personas within the enterprise. So the question is, why Databricks? Why did we go with Databricks? A few different reasons, right? When we were doing the evaluation of this couple of years ago, so we've been with Databricks back, you know, we started with our journey in 2017, right? We wanted a unified platform that would meet the needs of both the data engineers and the data scientists. We wanted something that's secure, easy to use, and that can well integrate with our ecosystem, both on the cloud as well as on-prem. So we have a heavy footprint on AWS. So Databricks gave us exactly that. All of that with a highly scalable system without compromising on performance, cost, and mainly any administrative overhead. So there are some numbers for our journey along with Databricks. So as I said, we got into this relationship with Databricks back in 17, so it's slightly less than two years ago. Our adoption has significantly increased the last 18 months our usage on Databricks almost tripled. Today we have about 170 users, 20 analytics projects using this platform, 35 data science projects, and roughly about 400 terabytes data being accessed. Have we solved all the problems? No. Are we moving in the right direction? Yes. So we have a lot more to cover within Amgen in our, in our journey on our data lake and, and the connected data ecosystem, but that's where we stand today. So the next one, I have a couple of use cases I've highlighted here. So the first one is clinical trials. This is a very crucial step within drug manufacturing, as we all know. But yet, it's a long process, two to seven years, and ex extremely expensive. It costs several millions of dollars. So a few different ways that this group actually tried to optimize this is really to integrate this with real-world evidence data. And then run statistical models to augment some of the traditional clinical trial steps to accelerate this process. So what we had to do what, using our platform here is be able to standardize and integrate different sources, data sources, into, our, into the rest of the clinical trial data. And then we had to give access for all our data analysts and data scientists to analyze the data and run cohort systems and cohort models around this. As we stand today, this system is shared between both our previous, previous version and the current version. Our data science jobs is where we are using the Databricks today. And we are actively working on moving this completely into our modern platform as we stand. So the next one, I actually have a better speaker who can actually speak much better to this. Noel Gomez is right here. He actually leads our data science teams within our commercial group. And he's one of the business product owner. He's actually the product business product owner that helped us expand the data science workbench. So I'm going to invite Noel here. You can come on up. So I just saw this slide a few minutes ago. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, I, I was involved in actually selecting Databricks and uh, not going with EDL 1.0 <laughs> because I saw that um, our, our data usage was going to be pretty high. And we didn't know, uh, we didn't want to share the, the, the resources. So we did see the same problems that, that were mentioned before about having the, uh, a shared resource. And, and I saw right away that, that uh, building the data lake in EDL 1.0 didn't actually achieve what we wanted, which was to decouple compute and storage. Um, so we selected that. And um, as, as has been you know, mentioned before, it, it really helped us scale 
a lot of the, um, the other two companies that are speaking today, we use that data in commercial. So we bring in a lot of McKesson data, US oncology data, uh, RX Crossroads for our, our uh, copay programs. We also uh, have Optum data. This prior slide that was talking about real world evidence, we use that in commercial. So our goal in commercial is to really figure out where are the patients uh, that we want to target who, who you know, would benefit from our drugs, and how do we ed educate the prescribers so that we make sure that those people understand how our drugs could, uh, could help their patient populations. So uh, we started by ha actually building that foundation. We needed to get the data in one place, so we, we started by building that data lake and, and the infrastructure to do the ETL and everything in Databricks. And once we had that, then it, that allowed us to now quickly move into uh, these data science projects. So we have a lot of different projects going on right now. We have things going on around conversational analytics. We have uh, graph use cases, so graph databases, uh, predictive stuff. We're doing things around uh, dynamic, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, targeting, dynamic targeting. So there's a lot of different projects out there. And what we were seeing quickly was that uh, we needed a way to let new data science teams get access to the data lake. And so that's where the data science workbench came in. So we, we said, okay, there are two problems that a person has when they want to do these experiments. One of them is uh, getting access to the compute. So how do, how do I provision uh, access to S3, access to Databricks, uh, GitLab access. There, so there's several resources, and these, these are all kind of disjointed. Not all of that stuff was uh, handled by Databricks. So how do I get a team to collaborate and, and get their own workspace and all that kind of stuff? So that was one thing that the Data Science Workbench was solving. And then the second thing is getting access to the data. So some of the data is restricted. Um, just like at McKesson, we have some stuff, not necessarily, we don't have any uh, patient identifiable information in the commercial space, but we may have things that are uh, financially sensitive or, or um, you know, because they're contracting or, or things like that. So we needed to be able to um, go through some workflow to, to get approval to that data. So we handle that, and then we may want to access data that is uh, in a different part of Amgen. So you know, the goal is to have one data lake, but the reality is that there are actually multiple data lakes and so we created something called the Data uh, Access Library, which seamlessly and transparently brings you a data frame as a data scientist without you knowing where the data resides. And so that is, um, that's, that's just another thing that we did to, to uh, speed up these experiments. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want me to add, but. No, no, I think uh, you got that, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Yeah, just, you can hang up. You can hang on. So this is actually my last slide and the most important one. We are hiring. <laughs> so if there's any data enthusiast there who is craving to actually put your skills to the right business in life, in our life sciences, check out our website, careers.amgen.com. And we have four different locations, Thousand Oaks, that's LA greater area, if, if you're wondering where that is, San Francisco. We have an office a little south from here. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Tampa, Florida. So check it out. And that ends our presentation. We are open for any questions. That's a nice crowd. Okay. All right. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you both very much, Deepak and, uh, and Noel. So now we'll switch over and uh, talk a bit more about doing, uh, doing large-scale data science on, uh, you know, on, on data in the claim space. So I'll, I'll welcome up Josh and Jake from Optum to, uh, to talk about their, their experiences doing patient-centric data science. Pleasure is mine. Yeah. 
He's got it. Oh, okay. We're waiting for the TV on high maintenance. Yeah. There's no signal on that thing. No, it's totally fine. You sure? Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Good evening. Uh, I'm Josh Firminger, data scientist at Optum, and this is my colleague Jake Secor, uh, data scientist and product management uh, at Optum as well. Um, we're really excited to talk tonight. Um, we're going to have three, three main themes. Uh, one is, is who we're doing this work for uh, and why we're here uh, in the industry. The second is pace, so how quickly or how slowly are we moving? And the third is, is really around accountability. Um, and accountability to not just the, the quality of the solution, um, but actually how we want to uh, uh, prioritize and, and use them. Um, actually, before I go to the next slide, I love the title that we have because there's two meanings to it. Um, be patient. And, and the reason I like that is because I think healthcare moves very slow, and I ran track, and I ran the 400, and if you ran slow in the 400, people were crossing the finish line before you turned, and that was very bad. Um, so be patient is kind of an ironic statement here, and I'll explain why. Um, the second is because in, in the way that Optum and Optum Data Science and our team thinks about this is, we have to not only be patient with, with the process and the system, but we have to be the patient. We have to put ourselves in the shoes of the, shoes of the patient and build out solutions that actually matter um, and actually are going to impact um, their day-to-day -day experience and uh, their health. Um, so who is Optum? I, you know, we'll just brush over these. We're huge. You'll probably get the slides, at, slides after. Uh, we're part of the United Health Group. Um, go buy our stock. Uh, we went down last week. Um, but Optum <laughs> is a massive company, and we are a big part of United Health Group. Our, 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 our sister is United Healthcare, um, which is in the health insurance, uh, health benefits, and, and Optum is, is very much centered around health services uh, and many different components of that Optum RX, Optum Care, Optum Technology, Optum Insight, et cetera. Um, you know, there's, there's new marketing that came out. Um, you could probably see it on YouTube. I don't know if we were paying for marketing ads on TV. Um, it's around, we are the how. So what does that mean? Uh, in my mind, what it really means is we're everywhere in healthcare. So we are the how because we're all in all places. So we have enormous breadth in what we can touch and what we can feel. But really what that means is we have a lot of influence and responsibility to how we solve healthcare problems. Um, what are we trying to do from a data perspective? What are we trying to do from, well, probably what's most relevant to this group is um, we're trying to use the, the footprint that we have, the 240 million lives that we have in our, at our disposal to really impact um, how the system functions and, work, and works. <clears throat> Um, I had wine before this, so I'm getting very dry mouth, so I'm sorry. Um, what else is Optum doing? So we're collaborating with researchers. We've put $3.5 billion in funding behind. Um, you know, it says innovation on the slide. But really what we're doing is we're trying to put investment into what we are, are essentially betting on is what's going to change healthcare, what's going to help the consumer, um, and what's going to help the, the greater enterprise. Um, so I said there were three themes. I've kind of referenced them a few times already. You know, pace, uh, who we're doing this for, and accountability. Um, but really, I'll, what we'll start with is the problem. And the problem is, you know, and the use case we'll talk tonight and the solution that we'll talk about tonight is very much about disease and chronic disease and disease, pro disease progression, as well as uh, individuals who are not being um, diagnosed with a chronic disease. Um, these are big problems that, you know, have major financial outcome and experience impacts on a consumer's life. Um, you know, we'll talk about one just kind of briefly here, a AFib. Um, 
20 30% you know clinicians are not actually able to diagnose or not be actually able to diagnose very quickly um, it's a problem because that has an impact on this individual's life a health a, a real health outcome um, oh they brought a water bear with me he warned you he was I did say that, yeah. yeah. Um, so these AFibs going untracked, um, these are also very costly. So if, you know, not only is if, if someone has, an individual has a stroke, um, again, very bad outcome, we don't want that, but it's also um, an impact to the economics of the system. Um, and you know, the, one, the reason we're talking about this tonight is, is because this is actually something that we have interventions for. So one of the things we'll talk about is we think about you know, who we're doing this for. We're doing this for people who have these diseases, who, who want to live healthier lives and have better outcomes. Um, but as, as a service company like Optum, we, what we want to do is we want to facilitate the right interventions and the right actual you know, clinical proven um, steps that we can take to mitigate these diseases or help these diseases um, and, and connect those to the patients who actually need them at the right time. So, you know, think about this example. I'm, I'm Josh. I'm going undiagnosed for AFib. We can facilitate, you know, I, I, I'm at risk, and we, we find that we can facilitate the right interaction um, before that person has a stroke or I have a stroke. Um, so that's great. We all we want to do that. I think we all want to do that. If we don't, my gosh, what? okay. Um, I won't share a drink. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but we need to go faster. So really what we think about this as is like at Optum, we're a very large company, and there's a lot of different opportunities to, to invest capital. Um, as a healthcare system, it's, it's also compounded in complexity. Um, there's so many different components. We've heard from a couple others tonight. But there's so much going on. There's so much complexity. And having the, the context at the right moment is very hard. Um, but as a data scientist at Optum, the only thing I truly care about is how quickly can I get to developing the model or doing the analysis that provides the insight that can help that one person or help those end of people who need it. Um, so pace, the, the, how we accelerate to a solution is very, very important. Um, but it's also how you generalize. So we, and our team, we work very, very closely. I'm no MD and I will never will be. Um, we work very closely with our medical directors to really understand clinical outcomes, to really understand the, the kind of health components that surround not just the technology, right? You know, I'm a technologist, that's what I get excited about, but again, I'm, do, I'm using technology to solve a healthcare problem. Um, so what we want to do is, is we want to take a ton of use cases like AFib where we have a problem and we have an intervention, and we want to develop algorithms very, very quickly and at scale um, that we can actually start facilitating the right interactions. Um, so, awesome. We needed a reusable mo modeling process. Um, so, I won't kind of go into too in depth to each component here, but you know, we have, we have claims, we have clinical data, we have pharmacy, labs, et cetera, et cetera. It just says claims, I think, on here. But, but really, we, we have an enormous uh, breadth of, of data. We have the ability to, with our clinicians, use that data to define the appropriate cohorts for you know, a disease we want to predict uh, or impute or whatever it might be. Um, and what we've been able to do and what we were able to do very quickly um, you know, about a year and a half ago is, is generalize this. So generalize the, the workloads, uh, the code sets, the collaboration to actually start producing these algorithms very, very, very quickly. Um, but we ran into some issues, um, scale, reliability, and um, well, really, it's, it's, it's those two. Um, but also, what I, what I would also add is reproducibility um, is something that we had um, not just a uh, an issue with not from a reusability perspective, but re reproducibility within the, the depth of the actual individual model lifecycle. So where did we turn 
And we are at a Databricks sponsored event, so I bet you could guess the next slide. <laughs> Here we go. Scalable modeling process with Microsoft Azure using and leveraging Databricks. Um, so we put in the components and, and, and applied the components with, with my, uh, Azure Databricks um, to really help us streamline um, and solve those problems that I was describing um, so that we can accelerate towards the, the actual healthcare solution. And the reason we did this is, is our team has a very strong philosophy that you know, as a uh, healthcare data scientist or as a healthcare, healthcare engineer, um, we, have, we are responsible to not get distracted. We are responsible to not get distracted by rolling our own solution from scratch when there is something off the shelf that enables us to deliver the value that we truly want and impacts the, the consumer and the business much faster. So using things that are you know, commodities to everyone in California that may not be a commodity in Minneapolis, that's where Optum's based out of, um, and, and, and taking those commodities, plugging them into our system, and actually focusing on healthcare problem. Um, so uh, benefits to this, we have scale. Th through the unification of this, of the, the, you know, the data munging, the data processing workloads, the model training, through this unification, we were a very successfully able to produce this um, reusable framework um, to, to generate these models at scale and do so you know, very, very quickly. Um, so the conversations moved from um, you know, how do we make sure we schedule these jobs appropriately at the right time um, to you know, the right kind of conversations, which are, well, why did the doctor say that our results didn't make any sense? Why did the doctor say that this, this, this individual was so much different than these other individuals. Those are the conversations that we need to be having, not how do I get my stuff to scale. Um, you know, this is a shout out to you know, Tim Rosenflans and Joel Stremmel and Neil Kelly and some of the other folks on the, the data science team who, you know, because we're able to kind of take away those compute, those infrastructure problems um, and, and focus on healthcare problems, we're able to then, again, put the right investment in the right areas. So, Leveraging some of the work coming out of Georgia Tech, under Edward Choi and, Choi and that, that team around Retain and the, the transparency architecture for EHR. Um, we've been very successful of applying some of this, this research to Optum uh, and actually contributed back to the open source community um, last year. And I think there's a, there's a group out in Seattle uh, doing ca cancer research that has a, currently has a PR that's out um, that we're hoping to merge. So, we don't have 86 contributions, but we may have one, so shout out. That's awesome. Um, well, it's very good in healthcare because in, the reason I, I, I like this event tonight is we need more collaboration, and that's just you know, one of my uh, personal opinions. So things like this, open sourcing, providing transparency across organizations is going to be fantastic. Um, one thing that I also get to say here is, is, is this research was trained on MIMIC EHR data, what are these numbers, 260 3,000 patients, 14 million visits. Um, we were able to train this on a lot more data than that. So let's just say that. Um, and that's pretty much a phenomenal opportunity for us to really understand not just um, how do we produce the right, arc or the right uh, outcomes and solutions, but also research. And how do we actually produce the right new architectures uh, or new ML um, um, solutions or techniques that are going to help healthcare use cases. You know, I, I love computer vision. I love learning the medium posts, but I don't have a lot of healthcare claims, clinical data, medium posts that I get to go and, and use to help me in my work. Those are all happening internally. Um, and I see that as a big problem with healthcare. And we need more of that collaboration back into the community. Um, so Optum's been and participating in that. Um, so I'm going to transition now to. Uh, Jake Secor um, to talk about how Optum is really staying accountable here. Um, but just as like a final remark um, for my piece, um, one of the, the, the things that we've learned in doing all of this, you know, 
accelerating, focusing on the right problems, focusing on the consumer, um, you know, being responsible with, with what the technologies we're investing in. Um, you know, this, we're not done. I mean, we're, you know, we've heard a lot of amazing talk today in keynotes, and, and one of our opportunities is, is we are a company that's enorm very, very mature in healthcare and very, very mature in components of, of technology where we're immature is bringing everything together. So we have enormous amount of work that we are still going to be investing in and growing. And in, in my mind, having a mindset of like we have to continuously hammer on this problem, that is the only way that we're going to be able to actually be able to solve these consumer problems. There you go. Oh, thanks, Josh. All right. So now I'm going to transition a little bit. Um, my part of the talk is a little bit different than what Josh talked about. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is, is how we uh, keep our accountability for our members, our patients, um, even providers, and, and everyone involved in the healthcare system, because we do touch part of the health system machine learning model can have. Um, so I'm going to put up on the screen a lot of pictures here. Um, and this is to demonstrate the difference between what we like to think of as high stakes AI and low stakes AI, or high stakes machine learning and low stakes machine learning. Um, people around the conference today and yesterday have actually been using the terms high stakes and low stakes, um, so I'm glad to see that we're, we're developing some consistent language there. Um, this is a, the easy part of the presentation for an audience like this, because everyone here is in the healthcare life sciences room, um, so everyone in here hopefully already understands that we are in a high stakes industry. Um, every decision we make can impact real people and will impact real people. Every person in the room is at some point in their life a patient. Everyone who we serve is a patient. Um, and so that, that brings to the slide a little bit. Um, I'll use an example of um, low stakes AI being like um, email marketing. So if, if um, your model predicts that someone will be receptive to an email trying to sell them a cookbook and um, the person does, in fact, buy that cookbook, great. That's a true positive. You did a great job. If the person doesn't end up buying the cookbook, that's a false positive. You've wasted the fraction of a penny to send that email. Uh, maybe that person was annoyed by the email, and they will choose not to buy your, your cookbook down the road when they're in the market. Um, it's not such a big deal. Um, on the other side, if you do miss someone who may have wanted to buy that cookbook, you missed out on the, the profits of selling one more book but the, the person will likely still find a cookbook that they want to use, and you'll continue to have your marketing, and, and nobody's hurt. Um, on the other side of that, we have things like prior authorization. Um, in prior authorization, if a physician requests a prior authorization for a procedure um, for a patient, presumably the patient has something serious that they need a serious procedure for, and the, the physician is seeking approval that the insurer will pay for it, us as United Healthcare and Optum will pay for it. Um, so if we insert a model, a machine learning model in something like this, a machine learning model that we know is wrong some of the time, um, we have to be sure we know why it's wrong, when it's wrong, and if it is wrong, we have a plan to fix it. Um, so here, if we do have a false positive and maybe we approve a procedure that should never have been approved, it's the wrong procedure um, that would have been caught in our normal processing, then we could have serious issues where hopefully someone doesn't actually have the wrong procedure, but we may have um, issues with the, the paperwork and the, the processing that does delay the procedure that they do need. Um, on the other side, the really dangerous piece is if our machine learning model denies a prior authorization that's really needed. Um, this is a scary situation where people may need urgent surgery. They may need some procedure that their family has flown to a specialty hospital to get. They're staying in a hotel. They're spending a lot of money to be there. They're taking time off from work. And our machine learning model just denied them their surgery. Um, and had any person processed that prior authorization, they would have followed the steps, followed the regulation of the company, and they would have approved it. And that's a serious problem. Um, that's where we can really ruin people's lives if we're not careful. Um, so what we did when we kind of thought about this and thought we want to deploy some of these machine learning models into the healthcare system impacting real patient lives is we tried to think about all the different ways to go wrong. So we took the list of models that we had developed at the time and we broke them out into what turned out to be four categories. A large bulk of our models, as Josh mentioned, one of them, the AFib model, is a disease progression model. Um, this could also include disease imputation models. And actually, so before I go into each one, I'll just briefly describe the picture here, um, and I'll go into more detail on some of these. So 
the y-axis in this diagram is the level of vigilance we need when we're monitoring these models. Um, and I'll describe a little bit more about why we need to be more or less vigilant when I get into the examples. Um, and then the x-axis here is how quickly reality is changing. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, you're seeing that reality evolves. This is a case where you may not be able to um, day by day see a change in something, but gradually over time you'll see an evolution. And I'll give examples so it'll be more clear. On the right, this is where something can change instantly. It can change overnight, and, and you may not have any evidence that it, it is going to happen, and you don't know until it's too late. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'm only going to cover two of these, and I'll probably do it pretty quickly. Um, but the first here is the disease progression um, class. This is a case where we need to be very vigilant in our monitoring, high on the, the y-axis, um, and it's an evolving reality. Um, so I'm going to give you an example here instead of reading all on the slides. Uh, we have a diabetes progression model that we currently have in production. Um, that model looks at patients who have already been diagnosed with diabetes, and we're trying to predict whether they will become high-cost patients in the following year. Um, and that's measured with, um, the model was trained on, on one year of training data, looking forward the following year. So in production, what this looks like is we'll get um, the data from the, the patients every month from the, the um, United Healthcare, the payer, their claims. And we'll run them through the model. We'll see what the predic pr prediction is, excuse me, for the following year. And then based on that, if we do predict high costs the following year, they'll be routed to a nurse intervention program. So they'll get a call from a nurse saying, how can we change your lifestyle? How can we make you healthier? We see that you may become high cost. And in the case of diabetes, once you do become high cost, rarely do you ever become low cost again. So patients who have an exacerbation or something like they need a limb amputated, they start having diabetic retinopathy, their costs are high and will remain high for the remainder of their life. So the earlier we can intervene on these, the more money we save for us as a payer, and the less hardship the patient has to face when they do go through these procedures and have these conditions. Um, so the problems here are it's a little bit hard to tell when we're right and when we're wrong. Um, this is disease progression. They evolve slowly. This is reality evolving slowly. Diabetes usually doesn't just all of the sudden become worse. There are some precursors. There, it slowly ramps up. Um, and so to truly tell if we're right or wrong, we need to observe for that following year, because that's our prediction period. So that patient may remain low cost for the first 360 days of the year, and then on day 361 and the rest of the year, they become high cost. So we wouldn't know that until we reach day 361. Now, if we do predict low cost and they become high cost early in the year, we know the model's wrong. We know that they, they we, ju we were just wrong in that case. Um, on the other hand, if we uh, predict high cost and they don't become high cost until the very end of the year, we won't know until the end of the year, like I just described. Um, but then there are more complications. And hopefully this isn't new news for anybody. We're all in this room. We may have gone through this already and resolved it. But we also have this intervention program. So when we predict high cost for a patient, they're getting that nurse outreach. If we have a patient who we predicted high cost and they don't become high cost the following year, we don't know if the model was wrong, the patient didn't become high cost and we wasted that intervention, or if the intervention worked. It was a perfect application of the model. They would have become high cost. We just saved a lot of money and hardship for everyone involved. We can't tell a difference in the data. Um, so that's a challenge. That's a big challenge for this, this class of models. Um, and we're, we're rapidly trying to come with the perfect solution. We're working on uh, monitoring data. If people hear concept drift, reality drift, things like that, that's a way to kind of a proxy for seeing model degradation is if the data looks significantly different than what the model was trained on. But it's not exact. It's an estimate. And um, these really are impacting patients' lives. OK, only a couple more minutes. So I'm going to quickly run through the second one, because um, I can hear they're already pouring drinks out there. <laughs> so uh, the second case is um, operational process automation. And this is still in the high monitoring phase. We're not going to get to the low monitoring in this one. But um, here, reality is changing. And I'll use the example again of prior authorizations. Um, prior authorizations are largely regulatory. They're um, instituted by the payer because they don't want to pay for something that's not necessary or could be avoided. Um, and so when uh, providers prescribe costly prescriptions, for example, um, United Healthcare wants to make sure they've tried every other option before going to this costly prescription. 
Um, and I'll again just use an example. Um, and for this one, I'll say uh, EpiPen. Um, this is mostly a hypothetical example with a little truth in it. But um, a while back, EpiPens were not overly expensive. They were the preferred treatment for anaphylaxis, for allergic reactions. People could have them. I think most people are probably familiar with EpiPens. Um, and so we would pay for them. As United Healthcare, we would say this is a necessary medication for people who go into anaphylaxis. They should have their EpiPen on them. But then all of a sudden, the price of EpiPen goes up. And us as a payer, we say, well, there are some other options on the market. We don't necessarily want to pay for this costly EpiPen. But keep in mind, the whole time EpiPen has existed, our processors have approved it. Um, and so all of the data we have says EpiPen approved. And so every model we train to do these automated prior auths says EpiPen approved. But suddenly we don't want to approve EpiPens anymore. They're way too expensive. So what do we do? The model has no idea. The process just changed. The people all know. The model has no idea. And if we don't do something, the model will continue to approve these EpiPens. So here's where we rely on the subject matter experts the most. Um, this is where we need to keep that human in the loop, like other people have talked about a lot. Um, we need to understand when something changes. We needed a way to intervene with that model, divert some of the claims that are, say, that are coming in for EpiPens, and say, don't touch them. We're going to do those manually. And as we do them manually, with our manual processors on the side, what they're doing is every time a new prior auth comes in for something like an EpiPen, they're generating a new training set. They're doing this manually. They have the new regulations. They're building up the data so we can retrain the model. Um, and so like I said, that's mostly a hypothetical example, but um, it's just emblematic of the impact that we can have. Um, so sorry I had to rush through that a little bit. Um, we'll be around for questions if anyone has any. Um, we just want to thank some of the people who have worked on this and open up to questions. So, you know, one of the questions that obviously comes up is what data are you guys getting other than the CCDAs and, you know, the summaries of care? And do you think with the information blocking rule that is now impending and the activity that ONC is doing, this is going to change and you're going to be able to acquire more data directly from the patients? So, let me jump in. Okay. So, um, the examples we gave there are mostly off claims data. Um, because we're a part of United Health Group, we do have access to all of United Healthcare's claims um, and they process a lot of claims. We process a lot of claims for them daily. So um, we kind of have that internal source of data that's a, a relatively clean data set because um, claims are on standard forms. And so we're able to, to bring in that data that we know and we have a consistent stream for production coming in. Um, and so I... Uh, what about like actual clinical data? Images, you know, surgery reports, right? All of these other things that are now mm -hmm. required. So, so Optum is, and United Health Group is so diverse we are in the clinical space already. We are in the pharmacy space. We are in the, you know, the, the claim space. So some of this, from our perspective, it's absolutely there's more ancillary data that we, would, we, will, we want and we think can help, um, help us, the data scientists, develop solutions that help uh, the patient, et cetera. One of the projects that we were involved with is like you know, predicting whether someone's going to have an asthma attack. Well, it's great that we have you know you know clinical claims and some of this data, but we really want some of that data in that moment, right? We need to see their you know what's the weather where that person is or uh, what's the weather in the home, things of these this other nature. Um, but that in, in our mind that, that introduces a whole another round of complexity of data uh, that you know for, from Optum's foundation we're, we can see we can be very very successful with the footprint that we have today, um, and I think there's there's obviously opportunities where um, you know, Optum Greater is, is investing in, in acquiring some of this new, new data, um, but it's, it's all within the, the, the belief, the belief of we bring it together. How do we actually first bring it all the data together as we buy these companies, as we acquire, as we acquire more data, um, but then really just making sure that we're bringing the right data for the right use case. That we're not just putting all the data in one big connected uh, feature set and just running all of our, our ML solutions and frameworks on it, it's really making sure that we have just enough data that we need for that use case so that we're, you know, we're respecting the individual's privacy and all that stuff. So um, there's kind of you know, two components of not just the acquisition of the data, but ensuring that we're, we're, our data usage is, is appropriate. 
Thanks. Any additional questions? Yep. I'll go to the mic. Uh, sorry. Uh, one of the pieces that you mentioned before that was that you were finding uh, things like preventative health measures such as uh, discovery of stroke prior AFib and collecting medical history. And I'm just interested in, in, in what you do in both those categories to not just collect the medical history, mm -hmm. uh, desensitise, de-identified, I assume, but also what, what you're doing in terms of how you find uh, that angle on preventative health. Mm. So we have um, Optum Greater, right, so we're not just a technology company. We're really, I mean, to be honest, we're more of the services side. So we're services first. So we're in population health. We're in um, disease, you know, within that, you know, disease management, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so really what, from a technology side, what we're trying to do is, right, so we have the medical history. We have years of claims. We have years of, of clinical labs, et cetera. Um, what we're trying to do is develop solutions so that we can, A, you know, have a, an intervention that we already have, a clinically proven intervention that we have for a use case that we can use and apply to be able to predict when someone may need that intervention and then facilitate. So when you say representative, I, my mind goes to, you know, around commercial, Medicare, Medicaid. Is it more, in your mind, is it more that? Is it across all diseases? Yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that's a big thing that we have to deal with is like, if we train on this data, but this data has, you know, somehow a lot more diabetic uh, individuals than the data that we're using in production, like that's a big problem for us. Right, absolutely. So, I mean, that's something that we, you know, in, in, in Jake kind of you know, covered this a little bit. That's something that we are looking, we are mitigating, we are trying to mitigate. Um, but it's so hard when, you know, there's n number of different diseases that we're trying to, to predict. There's n number of diagnoses that we're trying to predict. So a lot of the times what we've had issues with is we have a lot of one-off uh, mitigations. Um, so great, we've, we've developed a reusable framework for modeling. Really what we're trying to do is, is, is focus on surrounding that with the right mitigations for exactly what you're describing, making sure that we are training on a population that is representative of production data. If not, you know, launch, making sure that we have enough data to improve that model, fine tune it to that new population and then uh, do yeah, and also to add to that, and it's actually later in the presentation, but um, post-deployment, when you're in production, how do you tell when the data that a certain consumer of the model is passing you looks significantly different than your training set? Um, you may train on the most general data set you have, but if you bring in a new, a new payer, a, uh, sorry, a new provider or a new provider group, and they have a new set of patients, and their data is completely different, maybe they're in a different geographical region, maybe they're a different age group, we need to identify that the data that's coming in from this specific subscriber to our, to our API or however they're consuming the model, their data looks way different than everyone else that's using it and the training set that we originally trained on. And we may need to take the model offline for that user and understand that they need a more custom model to, to fit their data. Thank you. Thank you. All right, excellent. Well, uh, th thank you all very much, and uh, thanks again to our speakers. You know, we had uh, had three fantastic talks. Uh, before we conclude, you know, uh, one, one small announcement that we wanted to make is uh, one of the uh, you know, so we've had we've held these in, uh, we've held these meetings with our health, health and life sciences customers at, at Spark Summits over the last three years. But we're, we're we're trying to get into a more a more rigorous cadence with this. So we're we're very glad to announce that. Um, that we will be starting our uh, uh, Databricks Health and Life Sciences Customer Advisory Board. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start to enroll people in this over email over the next few months. But this is going to be an invite-only community for Health and Life Sciences customers to get together and you know, wind up having, kind of, uh, having a chat with our experts about what our upcoming product roadmap and use case roadmap is in the Health and Life Sciences ecosystem. But to also go ahead and network with other customers to, you know, to swap best stories, to talk about new use cases that are up and coming. So we're very excited to launch this. We'll be having a, uh, you know, we'll be going ahead and launching this with an event in the in the third quarter of this year, somewhere on the East Coast. Location and date to be determined. 
Um, but you know, if you're interested in this, please, uh, please go ahead and send us an email at hlscab.databricks.com. We'll also go ahead and reach out to, uh, to many of you over, over mail to go ahead and, uh, and facilitate your entry. But thank you very much for your time tonight. I hope, I hope you all enjoyed the talks, and uh, we greatly appreciate you all coming out.